some women have penises. I have the blood of an oppressed people. You're fucking a white male! Patriarchy, fuckface! The god BC culture! Of course! And go make me a ham sandwich. When I consider all that's gone on regarding the Kraut doxing scandal and his crusade against the alt-right regarding race realism, it really makes me sad that people have to go to such lengths to try to debunk what is a very simple concept or that they choose such a hill to die on. When I consider the idea of race, I have to go way back to really define what makes a modern race. Because we all started in the same place, physically speaking. We're going to need to be stepping back pretty far, but follow my train of logic here, and if you disagree, please let me know in the comments below. About 5 million years ago, the weather began to change. In geological terms, it began to change rather abruptly, turning to a drier, cooler climate in a rather short order. Now, this may seem a favorable change for summer vacation today. It actually had a dramatic and negative impact on the flora and fauna of the time, and I'm referring specifically to changes in the environment in Africa, uh, roughly 5 million years ago. Lucky for us, one of the critters that was positively affected in the long run was a monkey who had previously spent much of its time in the lush rainforests that were now disappearing. The lion! Yes, I know, Artipithecus ramidus wasn't really a monkey, but for the purposes of progressing my hypothesis here, I'm actually going to use layman terms as much as possible. Because once you start tossing around sentences like Paranthrombus robustus likely competed with Athropithecus africanus, then the audience's eyes tend to glaze over and they start planning their weekend instead of listening or learning. This also seems a pretty good time to toss in a pretty substantial caveat about this entire video. Everything I'm going to be covering in this video is my hypothesis based on the data I've collected. There is 100% chance I am not 100% correct on everything. However, it's the best I've come up with so far. The magic of the internet is the ability to connect with minds all over the world to refine your ideas. So please, at any time you find fault in my hypothesis, pause the video and leave a comment with a timestamp. I want to refine this idea and maybe come to a better understanding of people as a species. So anyway, back to the story. The weather changes in what was once a lush rainforest in eastern Africa, specifically the Great Rift Valley area, is rapidly becoming a grassland with far fewer trees. Tall grasses and scrub brush dot the landscape, much like parts of Africa today. Well, this change causes our little monkey to start spending less and less time in the canopy since it's steadily decreasing, and more time on the ground. I think there's merit to the most popular theories as to why bipedalism began, and I don't see them as mutually exclusive. It seems reasonable that bipedalism was much more efficient for carrying goods back to a mate, and that cooperation between mates would have been an evolutionary advantage when the usual diet was much more difficult to acquire, as theorized by anthropologist C. Owen Lovejoy of Kent State University. Plus, bipedalism is generally just a more efficient method of locomotion for primates, given our skeletal structure. So it's perfectly in line with evolutionary biology to assume the most efficient method would win out over time. Remember, we walked on branches, so it makes sense that we would walk on the ground. Additionally, our little monkey would be on the lookout for new food sources, as the usual fruit diet was more rare. So two things happen as generations of monkeys pass and get more and more upright. Bipedalism, of course, but also the neurons in the brain lengthen. Now, bipedalism seems a pretty obvious reaction to environmental changes, and the geological record actually supports this idea. However, I've stretched my synapses as to what would cause the neurons to lengthen. And I think it comes down to the change in diet. When we monkeys couldn't get our usual fruit, we broadened our palate and began consuming meat more regularly and, and in larger quantities than previous species. Now, my vegan friends, hear me out. We can assume, watching modern chimpanzee behavior, that our monkey forebears were omnivorous and wouldn't pass up a meat meal if it came to them prior to the weather changes of 5 million years ago. But I think, after their usual food source became less available, they began to supplement more and more on scavenged meat, which would be far more available on the ground than in the canopy. Thanks, gravity! This idea is backed up by the fact that archaeologists have unearthed fossil remains of animals from this about 5 million years ago. It's like 4.5, 5 million. Um, this time period would appear to show marks as though stones were used to scrape meat from the bones. Plus, it's not disputed much amongst anthropologists that the consumption of meat by early hominids is what propelled the rapid expansion of our brains. Meat is a far more nutrient-dense food source. But modern sources of meat are also chock full of shit we don't need anymore or that shouldn't be there in the first place, like antibiotics, steroids, etc. That's another video for another day. 
So if we combine all these data points and look at it objectively, it seems reasonable to me to assume that, simply put, the weather changed, fruit trees were dying out, so our monkey ancestors evolved higher cooperation between mates in order to maximize the available food. This resulted in bipedalism, which freed up their hands from climbing trees to move around and enabled our forebears to be able to consume a higher nutrient diet from scraping scavenged corpses. This better diet enabled, or rather enhanced, brain growth and evolution. Both of these adaptations to the changing environment pave the way for our next important iteration, which I feel is Australopithecus garhi. And yes, I know it's likely stone tools were being used prior to a garhi, but the level of skill of garhi is why I think this hominid is the next big step. For the purposes of this video, I'll just call him garhi. See, by walking upright, our ancestors gained the advantage of free hands to be used for activities other than swinging from a vine. Like I said, I think this is what led to the use of rocks to scrape meat from scavenged corpses, which then led to the idea of improvement of the scrapers, or the advent of tools. Tool usage by itself is not a uniquely human adaptation. Other great apes have been known to use tools, such as orangutans using long sticks to pluck termites from their mounds, chimps cracking open nuts with a rock, or Leslie Jones using Twitter. The thing with Garhi, however, is that the complexity of the tools they created suggested an understanding of improving the system in place to better maximize their efficiency. Garhi would look at a nut-cracking rock and see a blade hidden within. This to me is the turning point for what defines us as human beings. It's the ability to consider and plan for tomorrow. To my mind, no other species on the planet has the concept of tomorrow. A dog may hear the words, go for a walk? and get super excited because they have learned to associate that particular sound combination with getting to go outside and pee on things. Buddha, do you want gas the juice? Do you want gas the juice? Mom will gas the juice, son. Do you want gas the juice? Do you want gas the juice? Come on, gas the juice. If you told them, we'll go for a walk tomorrow, they won't have the comprehension of, oh, so I have to wait for the sun to go down and then come back up before we get to go pee on things? To lower mammals, and I use the term lower fairly loosely, they live in the here and now, with only a small window for certain species to have a basic understanding of cause and effect, or linear time. Those species would be the trainable ones, like dolphins, dogs, women. Insects too are a great example of this phenomenon. When you flick a bit next to an ant, they don't actively run away from the flame, they just engage the engines and run in any goddamn direction. It's essentially a computer program set up to respond to stimulus, but not make an informed decision on how to avoid the stimulus. Humans, however, have a concept of the sun going down, then coming back up again, and Garhi's refining and perfecting of his stone tools really highlights this idea. For someone, and I use the term very loosely in this instance, to take an objective look at his rock and decide he could improve the design for a specific purpose would require him to imagine a future use. How can I, in the future, use this rock to better efficiency? While the ability to learn is also not unique to humans, the ability to apply that learning to prepare for in or impact the abstract future is very uniquely human. And Garhi was the first iteration of our species to do this on a meaningful scale, in my opinion, setting the stage for the homo line of hominids, us. Every species of life at one point in history was so because they were able to utilize the resources in their environment well enough to propagate their species. The human line's brain evolved, enabling problem solving on a much higher level and if the point of life is boiled down to the simplistic idea that all living creatures live to propagate their species, the biggest problem facing all creatures is how to avoid being a victim of the environment they live in. If you don't have some physical evolutionary advantage like claws, fangs, wings, you better have something to give you an edge. Our ancestors had their tools, which enabled them to overcome their physical disadvantages against the creatures and other environmental factors they competed with. With Garhi, man's greatest advantage, as well as our greatest curse, was born. Technology. So with Garhi, we really start to scrape an advantage from our environment, quite literally and we began to develop a sense of the future. I can't stress how important the idea of tomorrow is. I'll be going into much more detail on the, this idea of tomorrow in a later video since it's really integral to humans becoming human. Uh, but remember for now that we started to develop this concept as far back as about three million years ago. For a second, imagine taking an African lion pride and dropping it in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. It's highly likely the pride would die off within a single generation, not because the lions are weak animals or they don't have high survivability, but because they would simply be unable to catch enough food to survive on or just cope with the weather. 
They are suited to a grassland environment and have evolved in tandem with the other creatures on the grassland they've been hunting over thousands, perhaps even millions of years if you count previous species. It's the snake venom versus mouse resistance phenomenon. As the mouse evolves better resistance to the snake's venom, the snake evolves stronger venom until you have venom so lethal it can kill 20 people with a single bite, but sometimes isn't enough to down particular mice species. The lions would die because they can't evolve fast enough to respond to the change in their living environment. With humans, because we could simply adapt ourselves to the new environment almost instantaneously by developing a tool to overcome whatever physical limitation we had, we were able to range much further afield. To go back to the lions in the forest example, if the lions could simply make a camouflage coat out of the natural surroundings, a lion ghillie suit say, the single act would likely boost their survivability because they could then blend into the natural world just like the evolved to do in Africa. But lions are stupid and have to rely on natural evolution versus tool-based evolution, so take them out of their environment and they're just big pussies who can't catch a deer. Stupid lions. Back to humans. If we fast forward in our timeline of evolution, hominids from Garhi's line of descent evolved further while conquering Africa and spread further and further out thanks to this ability to adapt a tool to overcome physical limitations in new environments. This almost instantaneous adaptive evolution enabled early hominids to swell in population and land coverage, eventually migrating out of Africa entirely and settling into what's now India and Europe, possibly even going as far as modern Asia. Regarding Europe, this first migration out of Africa by Homo habilis, a probable descendant of Garhi, likely resulted in settling in Europe and later the evolution into Neanderthals and modern man. Neanderthals played a key role in our story, but more on them later. Again, in the interest of expedience, I'll just refer to Homo habilis as handy going forward, as the Latin actually translates to handy man. Now remember, this video is about modern race realism, so why the evolution lesson, you ask? Because up until this point, I hope that I have demonstrated that human development, even back when we first were differentiating ourselves as what we would call human, was never really unique, or even noteworthy, but rather it was just responding to environmental conditions in an effort to propagate our species, like every other creature since life began. Darwinian evolution at its finest. I'm sitting here recording this video on a computer that exists because the first bipedal humans came down from the rainforest canopy to scrape meat off of bones with a rock, thereby ushering in the evolution of a problem-solving brain and technology to overcome environmental constraints. Just like a lion's claw, an eagle's beak, or a platypus's well, whatever. All are just evolved traits molded by the environment to help our respective species propagate. So the question becomes, what really is whiteness or blackness or um, Asian-ness if we are all just humans? Why are there distinct physical and societal differences between the various shades of human? I'd submit that the way these terms have been used lately is incredibly vacuous. Whiteness is, is used as a bad word and blackness a virtue when neither is good or bad. It's simply representative of an evolutionary track one particular branch of humans took versus another, based almost entirely on environmental constraints. Skin color seems to be the designating factor, but what is skin color beyond an evolution to deal with varying degrees of sunlight? And if the melanin in the skin changed over a long period of time due to environmental constraints, is it likely that only the melanin would change? The brain chemistry wouldn't change? Dietary requirements wouldn't change? Cultural behavior and practices wouldn't change? Sanctity of what it means to be human wouldn't change? Let's break this down even further. Specifically, let's start with whiteness. When one considers what whites do differently than other races, generally speaking, it seems to me that we, the whiteies, seem to be preoccupied with legacy, or what we will leave behind. See the Greeks' obsession with their names being remembered throughout history for a single example. Now, of course, this is, arguably, a generalized human trait, but it seems far more pronounced with whites as compared with blacks or Asians. Now, hold up, a quick moment of clarification. When I say blacks, I'm not referring to blacks in America. Uh, because of the history of American slavery and the unique relationship this caused throughout American history, the blacks in America who descended from slaves aren't really blacks in the sense that I'm referring to. Because they were uprooted ancestrally and immersed into another culture, completely foreign to them, the end result is kind of a gray culture, just mixing of white and black cultures. Uh, this is unlike when Genghis Khan conquered pretty much all of Asia, 
because the people he was inculcating into Mongol culture had shared cultural ancestry with him already, so it wasn't as much of a culture shock to either side, and the races were pretty much the same in that part of the world. That said, however, there is still some striking similarities, but for the purposes of keeping things simple, when I say blacks, I'm referring specifically to Africans. Um, super specifically to sub-Saharan Africans, because once you start getting into North Africa, you start getting a lot of influx of Arabs, um, and then you have, like, Egypt, for example. Technically, Africa, not really black. The result in America is that both cultures have been so interspersed in such a fashion that American blacks have actually more in common today with white Americans than they would of, say, black Africans. So anyway, black, back to whiteness. <laughs> black to whiteness. Anyway, back to whiteness. Contemporary archaeologists states that there were multiple waves of homos out of Africa, and I mean hominids from the homo line of descent, not Milo Yiannopoulos. One of those migratory waves was, ultimately, the forebears of modern whites, Arabs, Native Americans, and Asians. So if we assume contemporary archaeologists are correct that our wave left Africa about 120,000 years ago, we have our first racial divide. So blacks have been evolving separately from Asians, whites, Native Americans, and I mean South America as well, Incas, etc., and Arabs for 120,000 years. Is it possible that some divergence in the species has taken place? When genetic tests are done on African blacks, there are no, or almost no, traces of Neanderthal DNA. Remember that Neanderthals evolved from Handys who left Africa about 300,000 years ago, settling into Europe and evolving. To be honest, I think Neanderthals were the gods of old, and I'm working on a video expounding on that theory, but that's another video for another day. Since whites have Neanderthal DNA, but blacks don't, this strongly suggests that blacks didn't intermingle with Neanderthals. And since Neanderthals were geographically limited in and around Greater Europe, we can therefore conclude that modern blacks are the descendants of homos who didn't leave Africa. They stayed. They stayed for 120,000 years, evolving in Africa. So to me, the first difference in the races is what I would call the wanderlust gene. While it's highly likely Alex Timmerman and Tobias Friedrich are correct in their suggestion that the 21,000-year Earth wobble would lead to northern Africa and Arabia becoming lush grasslands for a time, enabling Homo to escape Africa, it would still require a desire to do so. Environmental pressures may be the cause, but the end result is that Homo left Africa and kept on moving around the world. All the while, environmental pressures are molding the species into distinct branches suited for different environments. Consider Asian eyes, for example. When our line of Homo left Africa, we bounced along the coasts in the Middle East before going north into what is Kazakhstan today, or thereabouts. Dr. Spencer Wells does an outstanding documentary on mitochondrial DNA and proves this theory of migration via the maternal line of descent. Basically, our mutual ancestors with Asians all went into the Kazakhstan area, then branched in all directions of the compass. What we consider Asians today went east over Mongolia, Siberia, China, etc. Because these climates were incredibly far inland, the most inland places on the planet, in fact, they were prone to extreme weather shifts with the seasons, so the ancestors of modern Asians would have been subjected to very bright, dusty summers and very cold, windy, snowy winters. Over time, environmental conditions would have favored hominids with eyes protected from those elements. Think that once their ancestors reached the coastlands, they would lose the Asian eye but it seems reasonable that sexual selection among the hominids, and not so much the environmental conditions thereafter, kept the Asian eye in vogue. What I mean is, those with the Asian eye would have been more attractive throughout generations, as they were the ones most likely to survive in the harsher climates of previous generations. The same can be said of Scandinavians during the Viking period. The bigger Olaf is, the more women he can bed, leading to a modern Scandinavian height of 8.5 feet. Just ask the mountain. Anyway, what you have with Asian eyes is a combination of environment forging the human trait and then human culture adapting to incorporate the evolution as a sexually desirable trait. The mountain doesn't need to be such a monster in the 21st century, but because his ancestry required it for survival, it became a sexually selected trait, regardless of environment. His kids can grow up in a climate the complete opposite of his ancestors, and they will still be the size of Volkswagens. So too with Asian eyes. To me, everything about the differences of the races can be boiled down to an environmental stimulus that forges a piece of human evolution along a certain path, and then the population sexually selecting that particular trait for its aid in surviving whatever the condition is. Skin color is the most obvious, but at the end of the day, when you consider we diverged from blacks 120,000 years ago, and Asians something like 40,000 years ago, 
To say that the races aren't completely different is pretty foolish and devoid of logical thought. Manifest Destiny defines whiteness, in my mind, and it's a result of direct competition with Neanderthals in an incredibly harsh weathered Europe and some parts of the Middle East by our ancestors, and by ours I mean whites now. The reason why whites came to colonize much of the planet by the 20th century was because the whites that survived direct competition with a stronger, smarter, and entrenched competitor roughly 30 to 50,000 years ago was to move and covet resources. Neanderthals didn't move much, preferring to have a cave base of operations and hunt from there, but homos of our line, sapiens by that point, were very nomadic hunters. We won out in the game of survival by gobbling up all of Neanderthals' resources. Wealth became a desirable trait, in that the sapien who stockpiled enough nuts for the coming harsh winter would be the likeliest to survive it, and so propagated down the generations. This created a very strong look-to-tomorrow mentality in modern whites, which leads to us working ourselves to death to generate wealth to give to our kids, who we expect to do the same despite the government taking half of it in taxes. All races have the desire to innovate and improve their station in life. However, it seems an integral part of whiteness, almost to the point of obsession. Anecdotally, in my personal travels, I've seen in many Asian cultures a much more laid-back idea of life. The reverence is more on the past and their ancestry than on tomorrow and the future. If it worked for granddad, it's good enough for me. This is not a criticism, it's just an observation. But then I always like to step back and logically deconstruct if my assumption is accurate. What would be the root causes, and do they make sense? To me, when it comes to the Asian mentality of the laid-back lifestyle, it's due in large part to the fact that the Asians had an easier environment as they trekked from Kazakhstan into modern, what we consider modern Asia, um, and the Asian eye stayed because it was sexually selected. Whereas the laid-back lifestyle was a result of not having the same environmental conditions that plagued Ice Age Europe, which is what the whites, in quotes, faced. Now, in conclusion, the entire point of this video and brief explanation is that our environment has shaped our ancestors all the way back to that silly little monkey who carried goodies back to his girlfriend and then who scraped meat from dead animals. His environment shaped him and his children, and our environment is shaping us today. The races today are simply representations of our ancestors breaking off at various points and evolving to different environmental conditions. It's represented in our physical bodies, and it would be the height of foolishness to think that these changes are only skin deep. So does race really matter in a 21st century world? I'd submit that it does, but it's only relative to the individual. What I mean is, looking at the history of my ancestry as a mostly whitey, I can understand that my forebears had to fight Neanderthals and the legacy they left me was to be covetous about material wealth. It's in my genes to want more, and I need to accept that, and if I don't like it about myself, I can actively work to change it, if I see it, of course, as a negative trait. It's like being predisposed to alcoholism. If your grandparents were alcoholics and your parents were alcoholics, you'd do well to never touch the stuff. You're already at a disadvantage from your lineage, so why chance fate? The same can be said for all negative aspects of every single race. I'm not going to do a list because that's for each person to decide for themselves what the negative aspects are of their race and decide if they warrant harsh personal scrutiny or not. But at the end of the day, in terms of interacting with one another, race is completely meaningless in today's world. But it exists, and the races are different for very real reasons. Admitting that isn't racist, because it's not, by default, saying any one trait makes any race superior to another. Additionally, even if one trait does give an advantage in a specific environment, the same may not be said of a different environment. At the end of the day, we might all just be stupid lions failing to catch deer in the forest because we refuse to admit evolution shaped our species. This is to you, Kraut. You are simply an evolved monkey just like the rest of us, but you evolve differently. Accept that.